I'm Rich Bentley. I've spent 15 years making documentaries all around the world. Five years ago, I chanced upon a little-known story of people trying to come to the UK by the most dangerous means, clinging to the landing gear of planes. As the plane flew over this street on approach to landing, that's the point at which the wheels were lowered and he fell. As I started to look into it, I became aware of a chilling phenomenon. The body was found in a British Airways Boeing 747, which arrived at Gatwick Airport this morning from Nairobi. He fell to his death as the wheels were lowered above this West London gas works. I couldn't begin to understand what it must be like to cling to the undercarriage of a plane, or what would force anyone to attempt something so dangerous. At 18,000 feet, aviation experts say hypoxia, or oxygen deprivation, sets in. At 22,000 feet, with no pressurization, the lungs have trouble functioning. It's tough to maintain consciousness. At 35,000 feet, hypothermia would set in, as the temperature can drop as low as minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. I learned there have been 109 recorded attempts made across the world, and that London is the most common destination with 16 wheel well stowaways in the last 25 years. There was little information available beyond these grim news reports, so I met with witnesses to some of these events to see what else I could find out. We looked out of the window and we saw this young black guy laying there. His head was on the curb and there was brain matter spread across the, the pavement and on some of the cars. You can imagine the fear, all of a sudden realising that the air up there is thin, freezing, rather like being on top of Mount Everest. It happened just along here, by this wall here. And it was in the morning, right? It was, except it was Sunday, so it's probably a little quieter. OK. But uh, no children going to school, thank goodness. Well, it isn't the first time we've had people falling out of aeroplanes in this area, because as you could probably see, the aeroplanes open their undercarriage around about now. As soon as I got here and saw the state of the body, he was mangled, you know, there was a lot of blood splattering. Some of his brains was on the car over there. You know, I know from the number of bodies I've seen, he had dropped out of the sky. The most affluent part of London, he lost his life in a car park. All of these deaths had happened just a couple of miles away from my home. And I was surprised I'd never heard about them before, especially as immigration dominated the news. Coast guards around the UK are stepping up their searches in light of reports of migrants trying to sneak into Britain. 3,000 migrants who have been camped out in Calais hop on board those lorries as they attempt to get to Britain. The electorate are generally not that keen on immigration. We don't have the housing or the National Health Service to deal with it. More than one million refugees and migrants have entered Europe in 2015. Amidst the biggest human migration since the Second World War, hiding in the wheel well of a plane was the most drastic of any journey that could be made. To understand how this was possible, I met with a pilot who knew all too well. In 1996, Mike Post was landing this very plane at Heathrow when a stowaway fell from the wheel well. This was the first death of its kind recorded in the UK. It was the middle of the night when we took off from Delhi. On this occasion, we were held for about 10 minutes at the end of the runway. And that is when I suspect he um, ran out and um, got into the wheel well. I don't even think I can get up here even if I try. It's like doing it under speed, you just can't really imagine it, can you? Blimey. Struggling. I can see the ledge. Here? Yes. So the wheels would have come up and gone into this big space? Yes. And what, we think he was lying just here? It's the only place, that's the only flat spot. Do you know how long he would have had before the wheels started to retract when it left the runway? It wouldn't be very long because you, you uh, call for the undercarriage to come up uh, when there's a confirmed positive rate of climb. 
probably a matter of 15, 20 seconds. I feel jittery just sitting up here. I don't blame you. The ledge that he would have ended up on, I, I would, I don't know, in my head, I thought it was sort of more inside the plane. Like, you can see the outer skin of the plane, and it's so thin. In terms of warmth and in terms of oxygen, he's literally, he may as well be outside. Indeed. I'm trembling. This yes. is it's scary. I don't like it at all. Yes. No, I think it's terrifying. There was no light, so far as I'm aware, in there. So how he found somewhere to dark. light, yeah. I have no idea. And it's so much bigger than I thought. Like, it's a massive bit of machinery. It's huge. The hydraulics are so powerful. They've got to lift these wheels up. Why would you do this to yourself? There's something really um, unpleasant about thinking about this was the place that he lost his life. Absolutely. God, the poor boy. The sheer desperation that must drive someone to stow away like this painted a bleak picture of a world where there were no other options. But what happened next brought this home in a way I could never have anticipated and drew me right into the heart of this story. I've just landed, I've been on a flight from Turkey. Um, and um, as I switched my phone on, I've discovered that a body has fallen. A man is believed to have fallen to his death in the affluent suburb of Richmond, southwest London, after clinging to a plane all the way from South Africa to Heathrow. A body believed to be that of a stowaway was found here on top of the white ventilation shafts. He was found in an electrical box uh, on the roof uh, with his legs pointing upwards in a V. Well, there's very little known about the uh, the victim himself. He was discovered early this morning at about 9.30 local time on the roof of the building uh, that you see behind me. But there was another twist. The man who'd fallen from the sky had not been alone. The second man remains critically ill in hospital. The pair thought to have hidden together on the same flight. Of course, we also don't know the exact condition of the other person and whether or not police have been able to talk to him just yet. Against all the odds, this second man had survived. Who was he? How had he got on the plane? And what was going to happen to him now? I made it my mission to find out. British Airways says a man fell to his death after stowing away in the undercarriage of one of its planes. And the plane was traveling from Johannesburg to London's Heathrow Airport. Another man thought to be 24 years old is being treated in hospital after he was found unconscious in the undercarriage. The miracle man had endured an 11 hour flight, clinging to the landing gear of a plane. Of the 109 people known to make such a journey, only 24 have made it alive. But no one has ever survived a flight for this long. Whilst the media was obsessed with the man who'd fallen from the sky, I wanted to find the survivor. Because here was someone who had defied all the odds and lived to tell the tale. Oh, hi there. Can I just run a quick in inquiry past you? I've been researching a case of a young guy that stowed away on a British Airways flight. We were hoping to speak to one of the officers that dealt with the case. Over the following weeks, I spoke to every single authority involved with the survivor. I'm trying to get a hold of someone in the press department for the Johannesburg Police. Have I got the right number? I'm trying to speak to someone who works within foreign affairs. Hello, can you hear me? Just so I understand the process, what would have happened is the Met would have responded to the incident and then essentially handed it over because it was a sort of closed case. Uh, OK, thanks very much. Thanks, bye-bye. I even met with the Home Office. But I came up against one brick wall after another. I was left frustrated. This was an important story and I felt it needed to be told. Whoever this survivor was, he'd landed in the middle of a storm. We are approaching one of the biggest decisions this country will face in our lifetimes. Is it not time we took back control of our immigration policy? Whether to remain in a reformed European Union 
or to leave. The choice goes to the heart of the kind of country we want to be. Immigration had become the political football of the referendum, and compassion for migrants seemed to be at an all-time low. We've got too many. This is what the problem is. They've taken over our small town. I switched tactics and started to reach out to those working in the asylum system for information on the survivor. I was determined that what had happened to him would not be brushed under the carpet and forgotten. But as much as I wanted to find him, I had no idea if he wanted to be found. I'd be so grateful for any help. Cheers. Bye-bye. And my efforts paid off with an important breakthrough. I was forwarded an email from an official source confirming his name. Themba Kabeka. I went back to everyone involved in the case. Trying to find Themba had become an all-consuming task. Then, at the point where I felt like walking away from it all, I received information from an anonymous source. Themba was in Liverpool, and they gave me an address for a home office accommodation block. All the way through this process, it's been like the smallest, smallest little fragment of detail or information has been a pretty major breakthrough. And I think because it's been going on so long, you sort of become a bit immune to it. But this is, in the, in the scale of how, how this has been going, this is absolutely enormous. Like, to have not just a city, but an address, and to have a name finally, is, um, is massive. But when I got there, I wasn't allowed inside. So I tried to speak to those people coming in and out of the building to see what I could find out. It felt like a long shot, but it also seemed my best bet for finding Themba. I've just spoken to two young guys. It's frustrating because neither of them had heard of him and it's not that big of a place that you would have thought that they would have done. After six hours, all I'd managed to do was speak to a couple of people and hand out my number. With no other leads for Themba, I decided to switch my focus to his companion in the plane, the man who'd fallen from the sky and died in West London. If I could find out the details about him, this might open up a way to Themba. A Guardian article named the deceased man as Carlito Vale from Mozambique. He was a similar age to me and had left behind a young wife. I couldn't work out who had taken these photos or where they were from, but they were my first insights into the people behind this story. I hoped this new information would open more doors but the only person who would speak to me was the pathologist in Carlito's case. What would have happened to Carlito as, you know, as the plane took off? Well, there's going to be two effects uh, from the point of view of Carlito. As you go higher up, the temperature drops, so your body temperature would go down. And ultimately, if you're in that environment for long enough, you can actually freeze to death. The other thing is you're going to have lack of oxygen and, and that would give you effects, confusion, uh, nausea, sickness, um, simply because you haven't got enough oxygen. It's surprising in this particular case that it appeared that he was uh, alive with a heart ticking when he hit the ground. If you have injuries that have got bruising around them, you know that the person was alive when they hit the ground. And we were able to identify that there were bruises around a, a number of the wounds. Really? 
So he was, he was alive when he fell out of that plane? He was alive, but exactly whether he was actually conscious, that's another matter. So the cause of death would have been reported as being the, the trauma? Indeed, and, and we use a specific term, we say multiple injuries. He died of multiple injuries from impact with the ground. Being here, I realised Carlito's body was still stuck in a mortuary fridge and that he would be buried in a pauper's grave if no one claimed him. I wondered if Carlito's wife knew what had happened to him and where he was now. The only details I had on her was an unnamed photo. I struggled to get any further information, except for one of Carlito's friends. A man called Zhao, who had grown up in Mozambique with Carlito, but was now living in the Netherlands. Zhao was wary of talking to me, but after weeks of exchanging messages, finally agreed to meet. I'm hoping that he'll be able to fill in some of the blanks that I have around who Carlito was, uh, what, what he was like as a person, and also what might have led him to do what he did. For the first time, I felt like I was getting somewhere. I wouldn't just say Carlito, he's a friend of mine, but uh, he's actually a brother to me. He was a very smart young man, but uh, very uh, charismatic. In the back of your head, you say, I don't believe that he went win willingly, you know, because the Khalid that I know wouldn't just take the risk. But I was shocked. Uh, that's when I said, uh, it's, it's not possible. It's, it's because uh, a few months ago, I got an, uh, an, an, an phone call and an email from him. He was trying to travel uh, to Europe. What did his email to you say? What are the steps you need to follow to be able to, uh, to, to come to Amsterdam and uh, put me in the place of uh, feeling guilty because I sent him an email with all the steps that he need to follow. You need to have the right papers in hand and you need to provide the right information. Why are you coming to Europe? What are you gonna do? Once you're here, you need to be able to, to, to work and take care of yourself. Maybe if I didn't say anything, you would have maybe not try to come. Maybe I would still have my friend today. You were a good friend. You did what a good friend would do. You shouldn't, you can't, you can't feel like that. That's not fair on yourself. Like, who knows what the circumstances were. You know, he traveled with another man and no one, I don't, do you know anything about this second person? No, no, never, never heard of him, I never got any information, even though the media say there were two, two of them, but still uh, I haven't heard much about the second person. Zhao had given me my first glimpse of the man behind the photo, and his description of his friend as someone simply dreaming of a better life was a reminder of an all-too-familiar migrant story. While Zhao didn't have any contacts for Carlito's wife and knew nothing of the survivor, Themba, it made me wonder if there might be others from where they had grown up who could help. But with more than half a million people living in their home city of Bera, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. I knew Carlito was brought up in an orphanage and I'd managed to piece together enough of the puzzle to work out which orphanage this probably was. I went online and I tracked up all of the roads from the orphanage and I phoned every single business, every single church, every single institution in the proximity. I sent hundreds of messages. One person replied. His name was Jose and he said he was a close friend of Carlito. He also said he knew Carlito's wife, Anna, and that he would introduce me to her if I could get out to Mozambique. I'm in a cab on my way to Heathrow to fly to Bira on the, the sort of hope, well, with a, with a tiny glimmer of hope that I might actually be able to find um, 
Carlito's family, and my heart is racing. I wondered if this trip would finally help me find out the truth about Carlito. And crucially, might his family and friends also know the surviving stowaway, Semba, and help me find him? Four years after Carlito Vale fell to his death over my home city, I found myself flying out to visit his. On my way to Bera, I couldn't help but imagine Carlito and Themba stowed away in the wheels below. I hope meeting Carlito's friend Jose would unlock the mysteries of this story. How Carlito and Themba made this journey, what was behind their decision to do it, and maybe, through Carlito's community, I could find my way to Themba. Reflecting on what I had gathered on Carlito, I couldn't help but notice the contradictions. On the one hand, he'd been described as a bright and risk-averse young man, but on the other hand, Carlito undertook a journey that was completely reckless and seemingly abandoned his wife in the process. It's quite intense being here. It sort of feels... Um, a million miles away from my life. I know that's a really cliche thing to say. I'm now starting to question my uh, decision making, really. What happens if there's another story and I'm about to find it out? Hi, Rich. Hey, Jose. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How's it going? Oh, good. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How was it then? Not too bad. Uh huh. Not too bad. Okay. I'm so grateful. Okay. Thank you so much. It feels really surreal to be here. Yeah, yeah, welcome, welcome. <laughs> this was big. I met Khalid when I was 10. He was eight, seven. What was he like? Uh, strong, clever. He talks slowly, slowly, like he doesn't want to talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good guy. Carlito and Jose were part of the generation of street kids left in the wake of the 15-year civil war that ended in 1992 and resulted in the deaths of one million Mozambicans. They grew up in a series of Western-run orphanages in Bera that offered opportunities for a more stable future. He would have been like a, a good friend, a brother to you? Yes and I was older than him. You were older? <laughs> yeah, than him. So you lived together for seven years, and then what happened? Khalid was sent to another orphanage. From there, we separated for good. When Carlito um, was found in London, uh -huh. it was reported that he was with a second person. Yeah. And that second person, I believe, survived the trip on the plane. Yeah. I believe that his name might have been Themba. Okay. But what I don't know how Carlito would have met Themba. Yeah. I don't know if they were friends. I don't know if they met each other at the airport. They were friends, but not for a long time. Okay. I'm sure that they, they met maybe on the airport. This was new information about Themba, and I was keen to pick Jose's brains further. I had a friend of mine living in South Africa. Say that he, he heard that he saw him, someone saw him there. After the flight with yes, Carlito? Yes. So he's back in South Africa? Yeah, so uh, I tried to contact him to get his address, but unfortunately he didn't manage to get address. Okay. So it means that right now no one knows who is he is. But they know, that they know who he is? Yeah. Wow. And do we know anything about him? Do we know how old he is or...? Mm, uh, I don't know. Do we know where he, where he and Carlito met? So he's not from Bera, he's never lived in Bera? Actually, I don't know he's from Bera or, or somewhere else, like maybe out of town or South Africa, the country. But term by South Mozambique, you know, yeah, it looks like uh, South Africa. OK. Yeah. I think uh, term is the one who encouraged Carlito to get the flight to, to England. 
I'm sure that they, someone helped them. At the airport? Yes. To get them to the plane? Yes, because there is security everywhere. It's impossible to get in the airplane that That's what I thought. So I'm sure that they, they pay to get in the airplane. Yeah. Yeah, they paid someone like a security. Mm -hmm. And then even when he gets to the UK, did he think that he it could just freezing. walk away? It was freezing. Yeah. It, it was freezing. freezing. Yeah. yeah. It was freezing. Temba is incredibly lucky to have survived. Yes, he's very lucky. Unbelievable that he survived. <laughs> he's lucky. He's very lucky. Yeah, he's lucky. Can you imagine if you paid someone, you think you're going to get on board a plane, you think you're going to, you know, even end up sitting in a seat, you get there, the adrenaline's going, you're on the airport, you have to do something to get out of, you know, out of the sight of everyone, and you end up having to go up there. So it could be that he, he didn't intend to be there, he didn't think he was going to be there, and then he found himself in the wheel well of the plane. And that would have been fucking terrifying. The next day, Jose took me to meet Anna, Carlito's wife. From all of my investigations, she was the one person who would know the truth about Carlito and Themba. It had taken me years to locate Anna, and I was feeling nervous about meeting her. I just really hope that she um, doesn't mind me calling in. You don't think so? I don't, I don't think, think she'll so. be OK. Yeah. OK, that's good. <laughs> But when I arrived at her house, there was another surprise. Carlito and Anna have a daughter. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Rich. Shamila is 11 years old and I was instantly struck by how much she looked like her dad. I've only been able to find out a few details about who Carlito was, but I wondered if you could describe him for me. Can you tell me um, a little bit about where you thought, you know, what Carlito was doing on the run up to the accident? And he said, I gave Rafa Katsul. Rafa Travayana Katsul. When Vazia Aviage did a vault, I did a vault, I shall do the best of Jawan for Saint Zeralcon. You want a Vashatia, Daddy? Porque às vezes ele não atende a chamada, às vezes eu não ligava, então me deixava um pouco assim. Quando ele volta de novo para ficar de sul, ele não chegou de voltar mais. Vieram os policiais de Estados Unidos. Aqui? Sim. Fomos encontrar no, lá na cidade, no hotel, então fizeram o DNA à menina e eu também. Foram para lá, voltaram de novo, então disseram que é verdade. Foi triste, porque a perda de um alguém que você já vivia com ele há muito tempo. Fico a pensando, né? Como é uma pessoa que já tivemos uma filha, às vezes aparece. Did you ever think that Carlito would do something like this? I think someone helped him, because he was a very angry person. I think someone helped him. There was a second person that went with Carlito that day. Do you have any idea who that person is or how they met one another? No. Shamila seemed wary from the moment I arrived. But when Anna and I started talking about photographs of her dad, she joined us. I, the, I've only seen two pictures of you two. And I wondered if 
um, Anna could explain when this photo was taken. Yeah. <laughs> How old were you two at that point? I think it was a Sixteen. No, really? <laughs> Had you just met one another? The Tomai is a is a Topai Carlit. Javis Lance, no foot? Mela Virgin, eh? A Margin was a sport, eh? First time you see the picture. The first time? That she's seen a picture of her dad? Yes. Huh? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't want to upset her. Whilst it had been hard to see Shamila get so upset, Anna assured me they appreciated me coming to visit and to be able to talk about Carlito. Being in Bera had given me new insights into who Carlito was and some of the difficulties he'd been through that may have led him to stow away with Themba. But Carlito's life, like anyone else's, was complicated. And whilst I'd hoped Anna might be the person who could fill in the blanks, she had been completely in the dark about her husband's plan. What Carlito had done and his death had come as a devastating shock to their family and was clearly something they were still coming to terms with. The hope they would lead me to Themba, like so many of my efforts, had only resulted in more frustrations. He was not from this community and I was no closer to understanding how he and Carlito knew each other. How they'd smuggled themselves onto the plane and what had happened on that journey for one of them to live and the other to fall to his death. Back in the UK, I followed up Jose's information that Themba might now be back in South Africa, but was unable to verify this. For every step forward, it felt like I was sliding two steps backwards. Then, months later, on Christmas Eve, having all but given up, I got a phone call from a very unexpected source. Hey, Rich. I do remember once you came to uh, Liverpool uh, looking for a guy who jumped from the plane, the plane wheel, actually, and you uh, left me your number. So I found this guy. If you can give me a call about the guy, the South African guy who jumped from the plane. I can help you. Thank you, and call me when you are available. Thank you. I'm literally on my way to my family's for Christmas. The phone rings, I missed the call. I just played back the voicemail. It's someone from Liverpool saying that they've found Themba. They know who he is and they can put me in contact with him. I can't believe it. Bloody hell, imagine if we found him. Fuck. Three years ago, I left Liverpool dejected. At the time, I put it down as just another dead end. But now, it looks like it's what helped me find Themba, the survivor. Only he's now going by the name Justin, which might explain why I've struggled to find him. I cannot believe that I'm potentially going to meet our man. I have no idea whether he's going to turn up or not. I've travelled thousands of miles in search of the truth, and now I'm back where I first started. Could I finally be about to get the answers I've been looking for? Hello. How are you, man? I'm Rich. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, man. I can't believe that I finally um, 
approach me. Found you? Yeah, I'm grateful to you for your time, you know. And how are you now? I'm just doing fine. I find it yeah, it's easy because people they're gently and nice, you know. Yeah, they are. Yeah, gently and nice. Liverpool is re yeah. like re renowned in the whole of the yeah. UK as one of the friendliest cities. Yeah. Like everyone's really super yeah. lovely. I had been worried that after everything he'd been through, Justin might be apprehensive about speaking to me. But on the contrary, he is keen to tell his story and shine a light on the experience of those seeking asylum. Everybody, they got their own situations. They live because of something's happening to their back, background, you know? Mm -hmm. Because like, for me, if I can say it, my background is very, it was very hard. I never knew my mom when I was young. You didn't know? Yeah, that. I only knew my, my grandma. I dropped up in school because I can't be able to pay school fees anymore. Justin grew up in a poverty-stricken township in Johannesburg, where violence and gangs left him broken. My grandma is the one who raised me from three months. Passed away from 2009. So you were essentially on your own as a child, yeah. looking after yourself. Yeah. And is that how you ended up being yeah, homeless? homeless? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not because I was raised to be homeless, just the thing, things that did not go the right way. How old were you when that happened? About maybe 14 or 13. I asked Justin how he had met Carlito and what their relationship was like. I met him in the club. He did not have a place, so I offer, I offer my place where I can stay with him because I have a place. I have my own, uh, what you call it, uh, a tent. tent. Yeah, a tent so for, yeah, with sleeping bags as well. So I take him to my place. He opened his heart to me, and I opened my heart to him, so we become friendship. You know, yeah. He was like a good guy because he was quiet. He don't like uh, violence. He likes to do his own thing equally and quiet, you know? Yeah. yeah. Justin tells me he reached breaking point. And with Carlito still keen to get to Europe, this was when they came up with the idea to stow away together. And where did the plan of getting on a plane come from? The plane came from when we were sitting in the camp zone. It came with a, a lot of books of uh, physical things, of uh, engineering. Engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it came with that oh, many books it bring it to me. I say, OK. When I, I, I saw the, the plane one, they were talking about different planes. I take the, all the details. So I know, OK, if we, if we can want to go in a plane, there's the other way you can use it if I want to leave. We have an idea now. Whilst Justin seems proud of the preparations they had made, I'm struck by how neither of them seem to have any idea how dangerous this plan was. Did you know what would happen to the oxygen at that altitude? To be honest, for me, the oxygen, all that thing, we, 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 it didn't even matter for me because as long as I just found myself out from where I want to be out, everything, they were just falling apart. So decided to come 2015 to just, let's get out in the country, just go, us, go somewhere else. I had always thought someone else must have been involved to help them get into the plane. But Justin insists they did it by themselves. How did you get onto the runway? We have to jump over to the fences. We are dressed like black, you know, because we have to dress like no one have to see us. Two t-shirt, three jacket, two jeans. So you put on loads of layers because yeah, you knew it'd be cold. Yeah, yeah. I find it really difficult to even imagine what being in that plane would have been like. We have to force ourselves to be squeezed inside there. I can hear the engine running mm -hmm. because I was not far from the engine. The engine was like opposite, but yeah. outside, you know? Uh -huh. You can feel it when it's rotating. It's like And then the wheels were still on the on the thing. You were holding, were you holding onto something inside yeah, the plane? Yeah, inside you have the small irons. You have to combine yourself in with that irons. You could presumably the, you yeah. could see the wheels yeah, come back in. Yeah, you can see the wheels that come inside because you have to open the, the, the chest. You can even see the houses down there. When the plane was starting to fly out, was flying, so me, I just like end up to have uh, oxygen uh, oxygen, it knocked me down. So it made me to go dizzy until I passed out. So when I passed out, the guy was talking next to me. He said, yeah, well, we made it. I never had na uh, nothing else. So you, you can remember that, yeah. but then it just goes blank. Yeah, yeah. It was heartbreaking to hear Justin describe the last time he and Carlito were together and how, in their excitement for having got into the plane, they had no idea of the horrors about to unfold. And like my arm, because I have two bend marks here. 
So uh, when I was put in the means the iron was getting hot. So uh, it burn, it burn, it burn. I it, see. Yeah, so when you were skin. inside, you wrapped yeah, your arm yeah, around yeah, like yeah. some cable yeah, or yeah. something yeah. inside the plane. So it and burn, it got hot. Yeah, it get hot. So it burned my. So I got two mugs of burn. Without knowing it, wrapping his arms in the cable saved his life. Unconscious for the rest of the flight, Justin did not know Carlito fell out of the plane when the wheels were opened. The next thing he remembers is lying on the tarmac at Heathrow, semi-conscious with a shattered leg. Can you remember falling out of the plane at Heathrow? The thing it made me to wake up is how I drop out. I was here, the plane was there. I was like asking myself how I get out in the plane, you know? And I can see these guys, they, they was the guard. They carried me up, I passed out again. That's it, I wake up in hospital. I was like in six months coma anyway. I was keeping asking myself, where's my friend? Because I'm alone. There was an officer, a private, private officer, comes to me and say, you recognize this person? Show me a passport. I say, it's my friend, Kalito. But I say, no, he did not make it. Justin has sustained life-changing injuries from the flight. But the thing he keeps returning to throughout our conversation is the loss of Carlito and the guilt he feels that he made it and his friend didn't. I find it hard for me because I did not expect that the way the plane was supposed to go. My life has been cut down to lost to lost someone. I used to take him like as my brother, you know, brother from another mother. He's the only guy who knows me more than anybody where I come from, you know. We come long journey together. So he's still my friend. No matter can be gone, but he's still my friend because nobody's gonna take his place. Justin has given me a harrowing insight into the circumstances that led him to stow away. But Carlito's motivations for getting on the plane still remain unclear. And it's left me with a sadness that his death could have been avoided. But I'm happy and proud that the UK has given Justin sanctuary and that after everything he's been through, he is now safe and has a chance to build a future for himself. You sort of look out the window and see Liverpool sort of going to work and just going about their normal life. And then this person is just walking alongside them with this absolutely heartbreaking and extreme and hardcore story. It's sort of, I don't know. We're inundated every day by stories of unknown people risking their lives to get into the UK. It's taken me five years to piece together the story of two such people. I've retraced their footsteps, and what I found is a story of desperation and naivety, but also of hope. It's easy to ignore or tune out of the news of migrants, but behind every single headline, there's a person with a dream just fighting for the right to live their life. <laughs>